welcome into the Vegas Squares podcast. We appreciate you tuning in. We've got an awesome podcast lined up for you, talking all things Stanley Cup final. We'll be chatting with Michelle Storino of Sirius XM's NHL Network Radio and with our good buddy Ken Bolke of the Sinbin.Vegas as we preview Washington, the Capitals, in their first cup appearance in 20 years against the Vegas Golden Knights in their first cup appearance in franchise history. They are one for one which is pretty damn awesome, especially here in the city of Vegas. The city is definitely uh, charged up a little bit more than usual um, as far as, you know, excited. You know, the fan base is ready to go. Monday can't get here soon enough. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about it here on this podcast. We are brought to you by Forward Mile. You can catch them at forwardmile.com. Subscribe to their daily fantasy services. And... Catch our premium podcast, and we are also found on 12OunceSportsRadio.com every Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. You can catch us over there on live internet radio. Give them a shout. Let them know we sent you 12OZSportsRadio.com. Once again, talking with Michelle Storino of NHL Network on Sirius XM Radio and Ken Bolke of Sinbin.Vegas. All right, let's dive in. My first guest, Ken Bolke of Sinbin.Vegas. If you remember, we had Ken on the Vegas Squares podcast, NHL Roundtable, to talk hockey at the midway point this season. Ken, I mean, can you imagine you, what you expected back then versus what you're experiencing right now? I want to say I was fairly uh, confident at that point, was I not? Uh, yes, yes, I, I would agree. Not to toot our own horns, but I believe you and I both predicted this exact final matchup. It's probably a little bit of homerism for me, but uh, I, I really did believe that the Golden Knights were the best team in hockey, and I think uh, it's time for them to finally go out and prove me right. Yeah, I mean, you definitely you got your horse in the race here at this point. Ve- Vegas has defied all expectations from everybody. Um you know, let's look at the other side here, you know, taking home ice out of the equation. But, you know, your initial thoughts were, did you did you want the Capitals or were you more apt to want to face the Lightning at this point? I actually think I would have preferred the Lightning a little bit. I think the home ice, taking that out is, is kind of, uh, it, it does matter. So that's kind of tough to do. So I think that it, it, it was a kind of a coin flip. It doesn't really make a huge difference to me. But I thought that the, the matchup of Styles. I think that uh, Tampa's a team that you can really forecheck to death, and they can, they're can they really bad breaking out of their own zone. I think that uh, Washington's a team that you got to make sure you stay out of the box. you got to make sure that uh, you're not allowing them to cycle the puck in your own zone the entire game. And then just make sure you're, you're clean through the neutral zone. They, they like to muck up the neutral zone a little bit. They like to get a little physical in the middle of the ice. And if you just kind of, Make sure you play a clean game. I think the Golden Knights are the deeper team. I think the Golden Knights are the better team. I think the Golden Knights are the better defensive group. I think they have a better goalie. I really think that they're just the all-around better team, and every every weapon that Washington has, I think Vegas has an answer for. Yeah, no doubt, and, and especially one of the biggest weapons. You know, you talked about, you know, like I said, taking home ice out, but now let's put it back in, and Vegas has, uh, if not the best, one of the best records on home ice this postseason and in the regular season. Um, what's that affect, you know, the, the atmosphere of what T-Mobile creates? Uh, we saw it once already. I believe it was December right before Christmas. Uh, you know, what's the effect on Washington that this home ice creates that some of the other arenas just can't compare with? Yeah, I think that uh, Ovechkin's quote at the time was pretty spot on. He said, what is it, like a pool party in here? It feels like a nightclub. And I think, I think what it is is it's just different. It's not like any other rink. It's a little bit of a different feel, there's a different location, being that it's on the strip and your hotel doesn't really have uh, windows and clocks and that type of stuff. Like, there's a different energy to Vegas, and I think it takes a little bit of time to really understand it and feel like yourself here. And then when you're playing against a team that's as good, if not better than you, it does tend to get on you pretty quick. And by the time you do figure it out, you're down in the game and possibly even down in the series, and that's where that first game is, is pretty big for Vegas to, to jump all over them and get that first game. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, and let's look at it from a, from a gambling standpoint. We'll talk about gambling much more uh, in, you know, with you in, in just a little bit, but I want to initial thoughts. Vegas opens up as the favorite. Um, you obviously, based on your explanation, you, know, you said from top to bottom, Vegas is the stronger team. 
Does that number, I mean, Vegas opens up at a 160 favorite to win the series. Is that number more indicative of the team or more indicative of the money that, you know, the books, you know, stand to take a hit from? I think it's it's, it's probably a bit both. I think that you're probably going to get a little bit more Vegas money, and that's they, they tend to not be uh, too upset with getting a little bit more money on the on the favorite. That's that's kind of the way that books tend to lean when, when it's money line numbers, so I don't think that's the end of the world for them. But I think the number's pretty close. I would say Vegas should be a little higher in that, but the, the way these series go and, and the way hockey goes is one funky goal, one bad game, one you know, Marsha shows skating through the blue line and getting a game stolen, it can change a series that possibly could be a sweep into something that could be six, seven games. And if you get to a seventh game, you really never know. So right. that number's pretty close. I mean, I would probably lean towards taking Vegas on that number. I, I think I'd probably get a little hesitant around 200, 210, 220, somewhere around there. But at 160, I think the number. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I definitely can see – you know, money going in on both sides, you know, but uh, as the more Vegas goes up, you're right, you know, that, that number gets higher and higher. You, you get a little worried, but it's the same time you feel you feel confident that you have the better team. Um, you talked about Ovechkin, you know, will you feel any shed of sadness if Vegas denies him the cup? Oh, of course not. <laughs> I feel, why, would I feel, why would I feel such a thing? I, don't, you know, I didn't the, feel for anyone. The guy just has been in the league for 15 years, and it's his first, you know, it's just you know it's you know you feel for the guy, but you know at the same time you're right. There's no there's no shed of bad you know any kind of feelings that I'm gonna have you know of sadness for Ovechkin if he. If, I was just curious if you know any part of you you, you know would would appeal to the fact that the guy's been in the league for 15 years and just you know finally gets over the hump and now it's a team that you know of destiny so to speak. If they were playing any other team, I might feel a shred of that. But <laughs> he got past the he got past the Penguins. He got into the Stanley Cup final like. I feel no, no bad feelings or anything if he doesn't get his Stanley Cup win. I, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that the other side, uh, they need a Stanley Cup win too. Yeah, most definitely. And, and let's talk about the guys in the in the locker room over at City National Arena. I mean, what's the vibe been like, you know, this week and you know, heading into this weekend? Which, uh, you know, what, what's what's the what's the vibe been like? You've been you've been next to these guys. What is, what's the locker room been like with uh, with the Knights? Like it's been all year. It's it's almost unbelievable that there there really haven't been ups and downs in the locker room. There hasn't been any moment where there's been strife or there's been some sort of argument in the locker room. We've seen nothing. They're the same guys the entire time, whether it was game five when they were on their little run to begin the season and shocking the world, or game fifty when, you know, they get into first place or so and or now, like Western Conference Finals, it was 1-1 in the room. And they're saying the same things. They're acting the same way. They're, they're just a consistent team. And to see it still be that way on the brink of playing in, in the biggest games of their lives and they're, being, they're four wins away from being immortalized on the greatest trophy in sports, it's, it's pretty wild. Now, now, you're absolutely right. I mean, they, you know, that's, that's the thing they have to have is the, is the, the – the sense of a of a of a calm presence and and being status quo, you know who are the guys in the locker room that have played in the cup? Obviously, we know Flower, but who are those guys that they look to for leadership and and the experience? And if they have questions about you know this kind of time, you know who are the guys that you know guys like Nate Schmidt? Who are the guys that he looks to for advice or guidance how to handle this? To my knowledge, the only other guy that's that's been in a cup final is is James Neal. I mean, Brad Hunt was on the Predators last year, but, he, you know, he's a healthy scratch the entire way. So I believe it's just those two. But I, I don't think they need to necessarily look to anyone because I don't think it's all that different. They they have the same mentality. Their coach is telling them the same thing. The, the, the locker room is acting the same way. The practices are the same way. The fan base is the same thing. Like, there's really not a huge difference. They've dealt with a lot. They've been a team in the media spotlight the entire season. You know, they went through the game where they played Pittsburgh here, or then the game Pittsburgh was there. They had the opener in Dallas. They had the opener at home on, on October 10th. They've been in the spotlight. This isn't going to be too much different from what they're used to. That's a fair assessment. I didn't. I didn't think about the fact that they've been pretty much playing big games or meaningful games all year. You know, given the fact that they're an expansion ball club, or not a ball club, but a, a expansion club. Um, 
you know, you're at CNA, like I said, you know, you're talking to the team, but you're also, when I see you, you're also in the stands as well and uh, from time to time. And uh, just what's the buzz with, with fans? I mean, you probably have fans there that are, you know, diehards have been fans of whatever team they were fans of before who are now, you know, Vegas fans. And then you have Vegas fans who were not fans of hockey before this year. I mean, when you talk to the fans, what, what's the sense you get of the community? It's just it's it's turned into like almost a college town where when you when you walk around a place like let's say Ann Arbor or mm-hmm. where I went to school, Columbia, Missouri, like not that it's the same level, but the idea is that you have to know what's going on. You don't necessarily have to be a sports fan. You don't necessarily have to know the rules of hockey or the who runs on the fourth line or the backup goalie or whatever, but you've got to kind of have an idea of when the next game is, what's at stake, what they're playing for, what's going on. And I think that you're seeing people that are getting to experience practice and games and the speed of hockey and the sounds of hockey and Unfortunately, it's sometimes the smells of hockey that uh, it, it's it's really special for a lot of people, and I think that the, the their ability to leave these practices open and to allow a lot of different people to experience the game through the glass and within four rows of a team that's about to possibly become the best story in sports history and the best team in hockey. It's 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 pretty unbelievable, and I think that it's it's really allowed a lot of people to have experiences that you don't necessarily get in a lot of other hockey markets. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Ken, on a personal level, who's more tense, you or your wife? Ooh, that's a tough one. I think I'm more confident in what's going to happen, and I, and I think that's just because I think I analyze the game a little bit more than she does. But uh, when when the games get going, when, when the games are underway, like I don't think she's ever had quite the moment like I felt like I was having when I was in San Jose and it was going to overtime and I just had this belief that this whole thing is over if they don't score the next goal in this game. I know it was only game three of the series, but you know, I, I know the locker room, I know the players, I know the mentality and I just don't know that they would have been able to overcome that and Luckily, at that time, that didn't happen, and you know, so I, I guess the answer is neither, but both. So I don't know. So that's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, because I, you know, uh, your wife's on social media, and you can definitely tell that you know she's definitely uh, uh, an intense fanatic of the games. But you know, she's very tense when it, when that time comes. You know, when when it is game time. So I can I can see both of of those characteristics in both of you guys. You know, the excitement, but as as, as well as the suspense and nervousness. But like you said, you're yeah, I mean, go ahead. The story is never, this is it. Like I, I, They may win another Stanley Cup. They may be in the Stanley Cup final again. But this is this is a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Like the, the, the Golden Knights will never play their first season again. And here they are in the Stanley Cup final with an opportunity to become the greatest story in major professional sports history in North America. Mm-hmm. Like this is, this is not your classic long-term drought story. This isn't. There's no story like this, and 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 when you really figure the gratitude, like the the magnitude of that, into what's going on in these games, it's it's it, the, the weight is large. There's no doubt about it. What about your story, Ken? Personally, on a, on a personal level, we talked about this on the uh, on the NHL roundtable back in January. Uh, you can catch that at VegasSquares.com. Go in the podcast tab and look at older podcasts. Uh, you know, we talked about your journey personally and, and Sinbin's journey with, you know, you guys all over there, you and Jason and, and the photographer. Uh, I don't know his name, but uh, it's Brandon. Brandon. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you know, this team, obviously you felt, you know, as a, a part of the team, you know, what does this mean for Sinbin, you know, to, to, to look at this brainchild from, you know, two years ago uh, and now – it's ex- exceeded all of your wildest expectations and you're just, you know, hanging on for the ride. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't even, I don't even know what to say about it. When I look back through some of like the archives of the things I wrote or the things I attended or, you know, I, I, I have these moments a lot of times when, when big things happen. So like for whatever reason, after they won in Winnipeg, I, you know, I'm walking down to the locker room and, I keep seeing Golden Knights logos and things, and and the the, the image that came back to my head was the picture of the hat that had the Golden.
the Knights logo on it that I had a few, you know, probably three or four hours before they announced the name of the team. And, you know, we kind of, I remember the day and what it was like being at the arena for the first time and being at, at, you know, walking through City National Arena the first time. And then even the first time seeing some of the guys show up and the first time I was at development camp and to see the logo on the ice. And it's, it's been, it's been a, uh, it's been like a career of, of like a 40 year old or 40 year professional just jammed into like 18 months (laughs) where you have this like nostalgic feeling. If you've been doing this forever, that, I was hoping that this moment would finally come. And like, for me, it, it's only 18 months ago, but at the same time, I think I felt all of that experience. I was there through all of it. So it's pretty, uh, it's, it's like, it's hard to even think about because it, it happened so fast, but so much has happened. And it's a moment that I thought was 20 years down the road. I, I was hoping it was six years down the road, but, Right. I didn't know, you know, you never know. And I was hoping that it would happen at some point. And now, now here we are. And, you know, there's still a lot to hopefully experience. There's, there's still the one dream that can't get out of my head that, that we're still waiting to hope that happens. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure at this point, you know, a year ago, if you looked, you know, a year into the future, you were probably like, all right, you know, May 25th, I'll probably be writing uh, NHL draft articles or, you know, what, what, the Golden, sure. what the Golden Knights will do. Not, not what you planned on writing right now. Um, yeah, I think I would go through this entire season writing any, any, they really mattered. Like, right. Took about a month that we had to kind of have that change in mindset and like, wait a minute, we can really start doing on back check and, you know, the line pairing and things of this, because this team has got a real shot to do some damage and, and little mistakes are, are possibly going to derail uh, what could be a successful season rather than what I thought going in was going to be just worrying about who's going to be there when this team's good. Yeah, definitely. And and Coach Gallant, credit to him, has pushed all the right buttons. McPhee's uh, made all the right moves from expansion draft to the trade. I mean, all the way up to your favorite guy, Ryan Reeves, I mean, with the game winner. <laughs> that figures, right? <laughs> It's poetic justice. I mean, I, I, I was initially on the fence with the trade as well. I understood it was more of a move to keep Broussard out. But, you know, it's, it's great to see a guy like Reeves, a guy like Carpenter with the assists, and a guy like McNabb with the game, the series clincher against the Kings. It just seems like every story that can be written in this group of short stories that, that creates this season, uh, it just it, – it is. It, it happens, you know? Yeah, it's unbelievable. There's, there's something special about this team and, and the, the – what keeps happening is they're just really good. So when you are this good, these stories are allowed to be written. Like if they weren't this good of a team, McNabb would never have had the opportunity to do this. Carpenter would never have had the opportunity. Reeves is never in that situation in the Western Conference final. So it does go back to how darn good they are of a hockey team. But yeah, I mean, the, the stories are ridiculous. Yeah, most definitely. And, uh, you know, something I thought about the other day, uh, my girlfriend and I were talking, you know, obviously Houston with the hurricane obviously won the World Series. We have, you know, so many of these tragedies that happen in the country, and it seems like the sports teams can rally a city, you know, at least to forget for that time. Um, one thing I thought about when I was at the last uh, Winnipeg home game in T-Mobile against the Jets uh, was the fact that I don't know if this is true or not. I, you may know is the names underneath the ice almost feels like a sense of these guys, you know, the the victims of the Route 91 festival are kind of watching over this team. Uh, do you, are is the, are those names still down there? And, um, or, or, and um, is, do you feel that kind of that sense, you know? Well, the names of the victims of that tragedy are in the rafters. On oh, excuse the me, you're right, the rafters, the season ticket holders so, are on the ice. Yes. Yeah, and the season ticket holders are under the ice. I, but I, I think that, the thing that's most amazing to me is you have a, a hockey player coming out onto the ice and, and the, the overreaching message that he delivered in, in that speech, in Derek England's speech that day, was whatever this team can do to help the city heal, they will do. And you hear that, and at the moment you think, well, yeah, I mean, I guess just go play hockey and try to keep our minds off of whatever awful event had happened. But you look at what this has done for this community and the way that 
I think that you're seeing people at, you know, all over the Valley and in grocery stores and restaurants that are, you know, talking to each other that never would. I I was recently on a flight to Winnipeg uh, from Calgary. We flew, you know, from Vegas to Calgary to Winnipeg, and there were probably nine or ten fans of the Golden Knights on the flight from Calgary to Winnipeg. And the moment that everyone got off the flight, we all figured, well, we're all going the same place. Let's all go together. And, like, that's not – if people flying from Calgary to Winnipeg aren't going to do that just because they're from Vegas, but because they're all – in it together, that has created this sense of community that the city had, but never really outwardly, you know, spoke about or outwardly showed to the rest of the country. And I think that you're now seeing that. Yeah, most definitely. It's a sense of community, a sense of pride, especially. And, and you know, we talked on a, on a previous podcast about, you know, the Raiders are coming, but that's not really a Vegas born thing. That's a relocation. This is the, the 100-plus year wait for a franchise, this is something that, you know, these Vegas residents and Vegas Knights fans can hold, you know, their hat on and show with pride, especially this year, obviously. Oh, 100%. I mean, they're they're always going to be Vegas' team. And even, you know, it's going to be just as wild if, if the Raiders ever make it to the uh, AFC Championship or Super Bowl or whatever. It's going to be just as crazy. The watch parties will be just as nuts. But deep down, you have to remember, like, the – the history of the franchise is not rooted in Vegas, and and for this team, it, it absolutely is. Yeah, right. Most definitely. Uh, I mean, yeah, like I said, you know, it's it's something to be proud of, something to hang your hat on. Um, you know, obviously, we're, uh, you know, you guys do a podcast. You know, you guys over at the Sin Bin, and we, you, you know, you guys do podcasts with you know fans or media members of the other franchise. Uh, you know, I've heard the Kings one, you know, etc. The Pacific uh, Division podcast you guys do. Is there any plans to do a podcast with a member of the Caps faithful or media or a, a fan or whoever? We are absolutely hoping to do so. We usually kind of run up and down press row on uh, pointing skates and then during game one and try to find somebody that we can rile into the studio to, to do it in game two. We have, we, you know, we, have some, we have some friends over there, and then there's, of course, the uh, Russian machine never breaks guys that we kind of uh, – for all intents and purposes, we kind of built our site, you know, using them as, as a bit of a blueprint. So I'd love to have somebody from that, that, that site on or as many guys as are in town. So, yeah, I hope that we can wind up getting that done. But uh, at the moment, there's nothing officially on the book, so I can't guarantee that. But it's certainly something we always look to do. Right on. And, and, and you've, you know, I've, I've covered, uh, and, uh, excuse me, I've covered a Super Bowl on Press Row. And the, the exposure and the amount of media there is incredible to say the least and uh what are your expectations for kind of that similar press row or you know the media spotlight for this stanley cup final not just because it's in vegas but just in general as the stanley cup what do you what are your expectations for when you get down there i really don't know like i'm I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around what it's like i know that they've they've made some some little tweaks uh with moving media around at, at City National Arena, and they're doing a full media day down at T-Mobile Arena, which will be different from anything we've ever seen before. But I go back to, like, there have been a lot of moments where there's been a lot of people that have wanted to, to cover this team, and I don't know how different it's going to be. I think it's going to be a little bit of a larger scale, but I don't think it's going to be something that's um, so different that, that it's going to be almost, you know, we, we can't believe what we're seeing. And uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I'm, I'm not expecting anything too outrageous from what we've seen throughout the year. Fair enough, fair enough. Let's dive into the game just a little bit here, uh, just a couple of things. You know, who who do you consider, you know, you talked about, you know, Marcia So stealing games uh, is what they've called it. You know, who do you consider other than Flower the X factor uh, for Vegas against uh, the Capitals? I think it's it's the two best groups on the team. I, I think I think that the Golden Knights top line is kind of going to be the difference in this series. I, I I really just don't think that a top line of Ovechkin, Kuznetsov, and Tom Wilson can stay with the Golden Knights top line all over the ice. Like, yeah, they're going to be good offensively and they'll do their thing. And you know, Carlson, Marcia, and Smith have to be good, slowing them down in the, in the defensive zone. But when the pucks in the neutral zone or in the Golden Knights zone, it's going to really be dangerous for that Washington top line. And if they can make things happen, like I think that they will be able to do it, like they were able to do in the two, the phase two, this play before, I think it's going to
going to be a, a series where you look back and think, man, that top line was really just fantastic. And I think that's what it's been all season long, and that will continue. And then the other one would be Nate Schmidt and Braden McNabb. I think that their role is to do their best to keep Ovechkin out of the game. If you can keep Ovechkin out of these games, they're going to have a really difficult time winning them. Mm-hmm. And you again, you saw that in the two games that these two teams played. Ovechkin had one shot in one of the games. He didn't score a goal in either. And I think that that's what's going to be the difference is Nate Schmidt's ability to kind of take a superstar out of games as he's shown to do, especially superstars that can't skate around him. There are the occasional guys that face trouble that were that were just flat out faster than him. That's not the case here. Kuznetsov may have that at times, but I don't think that Wilson and Ovechkin can keep up with him to make that that much of a difference. So I, I really think that you're going to see that the, the top end talent of the Golden Knights, the guys that have been driving the bus the entire time, they're going to continue doing it. And I think they're going to do it in an even bigger fashion than they've done thus far through three rounds. What's Nate Schmidt's week been like? You know, you talked about Nate. Obviously, you know, this whole year has been mired around, you know, one guy facing his former team or a couple guys in in the case of the Panthers, you know, getting that chip on their shoulder, elevating their game. Now Nate's going to get at least four, possibly seven, uh, against a team that left him unprotected. You know, what's his... What's his week been like? You know, I'm sure he's gotten that question at least 300,000 times. Yeah, I'm sure his, his, uh, he's going to get bored of answering the exact same question over and over and over again for the next three days. But if you could pick a guy in that locker room that you would want to deal with that situation, it would be him. Like, he's, he loves talking. He loves talking to the media. He loves interacting with everybody. And he's going to have absolutely no problem handling it. And I'm 100% confident that, He's never going to say anything that's going to put him him or the team in trouble and, and put them behind the eight ball board wise. So I think that, it, it, you know, looking back, it's kind of the perfect guy to have that option. And, and I kind of like that somebody has it because you are going to see other guys kind of rallying behind him because they see all of what he's has to go through where had it been against Tampa, you would not have had that guy. And I think it would have kind of fallen on the shoulders of everybody and it might have weight on some guys more than others, where in this case, I think it falls on the shoulders of the right guy. So I, I think it can actually be a benefit in that case. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, if anybody is as energetic and positive you know, on that team, it's Nate Schmidt, without a doubt. Uh, let's talk about you, because uh, you are somewhat of a celebrity at this point. I uh, saw you on ESPN. Oh, did that lose you? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I saw you on ESPN uh, showing your uh, your ticket that you placed at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I don't. I think celebrity is probably a bit of a strong term. I uh, oh, don't be so modest. I don't know about that. I'm still cleaning up dog pee about four times a day, so I wouldn't go that far yet. But uh, yeah, I placed the bet uh, to a five dollar ticket at a hundred to one, and it was honestly supposed to be a souvenir. It wasn't. It wasn't supposed to. You know, I didn't look at the odds and think, ooh, 100 to 1, they've got a better chance of winning than that. Like, no, I thought I was going to buy a $5 ticket every single year until they won. And that one that won at probably 8 to 1 would be a cool one to have and worth 40 bucks, and it would be paying off some of the old ones. But, no, it was really supposed to be just a, a shadow box type deal, and now it's turning into a lot bigger of a deal, but uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know. Maybe I won't even cash it. I think it'd be even a cooler story if I didn't cash it. Fair enough. I, you're right. I mean, because once you cash it, you got to give it back. So it, it's almost, you know, what's that piece of paper worth as far as the memories over, you said 100 to 1 at 5 bucks, so 500 bucks at that point. Yeah. Um, have you talked to sports books and, and, and what they're kind of sweating or what their thoughts are, you know, with these potential payouts, not necessarily your payout, but there's been some payouts uh, of six figures, you know, uh, taken at some of the places like Westgate, Las Vegas, uh, you know, among others. You know, have you talked to any of the sports books about what they're, you know, doing to prepare for this? You know, because obviously they never could have thought about that at putting him out 300, 500 to one. Yeah, I think the liability at pretty much every single sports book in town is an absolute disaster. It'll without question be their worst loss in hockey history, no matter what. Uh, how many games this goes or what that's come on in throughout the entire playoffs. Like having hundreds of tickets that are a hundred to one or worse is, is rough. And even through the season, like they didn't, they didn't 
dramatically lower that number all that quickly. When they were eight and one, it was still pushing fifty or sixty to one or so. So those numbers still being out there, it's certainly there. But that being said, I think that the best thing for sports books is to kind of understand that giving this money to people isn't the end of the world. The amount of publicity they're getting, the amount of talk that comes about how the betters finally beat the sports books, like Every once in a while, that needs to be in the narrative so that people continue to believe that it is possible. And that uh, I think that's what sports books want. So I don't, I don't think it's really, you know, they're sitting there rooting probably, hopefully, that uh, Game 7 goes against the Golden Knights and, you know, they, they get out of all of that. But at the same time, if it does wind up happening, I think they should, they should throw a big party and allow people to come and cash these tickets and, and you know, encourage them to continue betting and continue uh, – doing their thing because you know in the end we all get the money back we all know that that's how this works so for the sports books to kind of you know shrivel up and go in a corner and be sad i think would be a terrible decision on their part right most definitely and especially with the the news lately of of legalized gambling you know across the country this is definitely something to say hey still come to vegas put your money down come you know enjoy the party and and uh win some money from us so yeah you're absolutely right um, I would I would say, you know, hedging options for you, but it sounds like either it's going to be a souvenir for you, so we'll take hedging out of the equation for you. Yeah, there's no I, I, I can't. And I not mention I think they're going to win the series, so I think hedging would be just throwing me away. I, I really do think they're the better team. I think that they have a better scenario. I think that everything about it, they should be able to win this series. And if they don't, it's, it's going to be, be because they didn't play their best hockey, and they got to find a way to play four great games over the next seven. And if they do that, they should be able to, to hoist the Stanley Cup. It's crazy. All right, so prediction time. Knights in. Uh, my official prediction has been five. Uh, I, I, I think that at some point they're, they're going to stub their toe in a game here or there. I don't, I don't know how that will necessarily happen, but. I think they're going to control a majority of the games. I think they're going to be the better team in a majority of the games that you're watching, and I don't think it's going to be a terribly long series. I actually think this is the second easiest series that the Golden Knights will have faced in this postseason. I think that this team uh, it matches up better with the Capitals than they did with the Sharks, and I think it's a much better matchup than they were with the Jets. So I, I really think if they were able to dispatch those teams in five and six, there's no reason they can't do this one in four or five. Fair enough. Knights in five. You heard it from Ken Bolke. All right, Ken, last question. I'll let you go. Um, put your mayor hat on. Knights win the cup. Where's the parade? Do they shut down the strip or do we put it somewhere else? Oh, you got to shut down the strip. I've actually uh, got a little bit of info on it. Apparently, there's going to be more than one, oh. up, up to possibly even three in, in uh, Vegas, possibly the third one being Henderson. Uh, I would assume there will be one in downtown Summerlin, kind of going from the uh, practice facility down to downtown Summerlin. The other one, I would assume they have to find a way to uh, integrate downtown as well as the strip. I would assume you just kind of drive down the strip and allow people to stand along the strip and then uh, wind up with the big one being right out in front of T-Mobile Arena is how I would do it. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, one on the strip, one on Fremont Street experience would be great. And then that, that area of downtown Summerlin, that, that side road is uh, an ideal spot for a parade too. So, yeah. For sure. You know, if they win, bring on a parade every day. Well, I, mean, I don't want to get tired, but, you know, bring on a parade as much as they can. I'll be at every single one of them, including the one that I think may, may even happen in Whitefish, Montana, where Foley's from. I think they may bring the cup up there and do a little parade up there. So there, there's there's a lot to look forward to, but they got to get four wins first. Right, definitely. You don't want to get too far ahead of yourself. But, you know, the fans, it's, it's like the lottery thing. It's nice to dream, you know, in the future if you had that experience to, to provide. So, uh, Ken, we appreciate you coming on, and uh, you guys can catch him. Ken and all the guys at Sinbin Vegas, uh, Sinbin.Vegas on Twitter, Sinbin.Vegas uh, in your browser. Ken, you know, it's going to be a hell of a ride for the next two weeks. Uh, we appreciate you taking some time out of this busy schedule to come and chat with us. You got it. Hopefully my cup and one prediction is, is a good one. Yeah, the T-shirts definitely seem to be very uh, topical, <laughs> topical at this point. <laughs> so, all right, thanks, Ken. We appreciate it. You got it. All right, take care. All right, without further ado, my next guest, Michelle Storino of Sirius XM's NHL Network Radio, Channel 91, show is Ice Cap. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me. We absolutely. We are definitely honored. You've been in, you know, following NHL for a long time, and uh, you got, uh, you know, the Capitals with their first cup in 20 years, first cup appearance, and then you have the upstart Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, your initial thoughts on the matchup that we're going to see here come Monday, uh, Monday evening. 
Well, first of all, it's I don't think anybody could have written this or anybody really predicted it at the beginning of the season, let alone the beginning of the postseason. I know I definitely did not. Um, I'm very happy for someone like Alexander Ovechkin finally getting a shot to, you know, make it to the dance, essentially. Um, He's obviously waited a long time, and I just feel around the Capitals team, he's different. You know, uh, listening to him a lot, uh, you know, either in preview or post-game clips, he just sounds like a completely different player, and I think that's kind of coming across in terms of the rest of the team. It's just this renewed confidence, this calm, relaxed, uh, nature about him where the pressure isn't really there anymore. So it's, for me, it's really nice to see him do this. And then finally, you know, it will kind of like cement his legacy if he were to win. Vegas, on the other hand, was a phenomenal story. I mean, it's the greatest sports story this year for sure. And I think it's honestly, I mean, we're, they're four wins away from being the best hockey story of all time. And uh, it's funny, on social media, a lot of people... Obviously, the miracle on ice, I understand, 1980, I get uh, how big that was. However, I mean, being an inaugural team and uh, such underdogs and coming together and doing what they've been able to do, it's just such a phenomenal story. Plus, you add the whole idea of that they were essentially cast off, even though you know, grand scheme, you know, the salary cap kind of did this in the first place. But, uh, I mean, it's just a phenomenal story. Both sides are so great, and they're coming at it from completely different directions. Yet the one thing that definitely they have in common and which we'll, we will see for the first time, and I think it's seven seasons, is that we're going to have a team winning the Stanley Cup for the first time in their franchise history. So, um, either way, it's a really cool story from both sides, even though they're both uh, vastly different. Yeah, uh, most definitely. And you touched on uh, and you touched on Ovechkin there in in your first part of, of your answer. And uh, you know, my my thoughts initially, and, and I'll I'll ask you is, once he got over the Pittsburgh hump, it, it just seemed like, you know, now he's like, I can do anything. I mean, what are your what, is that what you're kind of saying when the pressure's off? Yeah, yeah, and you know, and it's just funny that not only is it Pittsburgh, but it's also congruent with the second round. So I don't know if, would people be saying the same thing if he beat Pittsburgh in the first round? No, because what if he ended up losing in the second round? You know what I mean? I just kind of feel like it was uh, both. You know, the fact that it was past the second round, which he he had never been, and it was the Pittsburgh Penguins as well, on top of the fact that it's Sidney Crosby, the person he gets compared to uh, the most in his entire career. So Mm -hmm. The thing that, you know, to me, with Ovi is that we could put these comparisons between him and Sid to bed. Like, I don't really think there is a comparison. They're two vastly different players, uh, both putting up, you know, amazing amounts of points for, uh, you know, their time in the league, which is identical. But they lead differently. They play different styles. They just see the ice differently. I mean, and they're both going to going to have their legacies in NHL lore forever. So, um, yeah, but I think you are right to an extent as well. It's just once they got past Pittsburgh and the fact that it was a second round, uh, getting past the second round, it was kind of like killing two birds with one stone. And now, you know, kind of who cares? And it's just interesting because, you know, now they're four wins away from winning it all. And essentially, how could they not be, uh, you know, the favorites in this whole situation, right? I mean, they clearly have, you know, more experience in terms of uh, just, I don't know, players being, obviously being together and going through thick and thin, him and Backstrom and right. uh, John Carlson, you know, Britton Holby, so on and so forth. But I just kind of feel like they still have a little bit of an edge because, uh, Vegas is truly the number one underdog story, really, of all time. I don't know. I, I think it's just a remarkable story. Yeah, absolutely. As far as team continuity, I mean, obviously Vegas has no comparison to the Caps. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Vegas right now doesn't see it that way. Vegas is is uh, is, is has their home team as the favorite. Uh, I personally think it's it's because of what we'll talk about later is the 
the sports book's chance of, of losing a lot of money. I think they're trying to get it back on the other side. But uh, let's talk about VGK there. I mean, you know, you were around, you know, talking about the, the, the predictions after the uh, expansion draft and before this season. I mean, what were your honest early thoughts and, and where did you think? Because I'll be honest, I thought I, I took the under on, on 65 points and, and clearly I was vastly incorrect. <laughs> so what were your well, initial thoughts? So this is the hilarious part I find about Vegas' run is now everybody clearly hates being wrong. I get it. No one likes being wrong, but I love being surprised. So right. um, I did not have them um, obviously doing very well, and I'm trying to think in terms of where I had them in the Pacific. I don't even I don't know if I had them last, um, just because I didn't know what to expect. And same thing, I had them in and around the same kind of points range as the Vancouver Canucks, just because, you know, Travis Green was new there as well. There was just so much, you know, new come in the Pacific Division when you look at it. Mm -hmm. It's three teams with brand new coaches, right? You had Gerald Galan in Vegas, you had Travis Green in uh, Vancouver, you also had Rick Tockett in Arizona. So you didn't really know what you were going to get from those three teams, but I thought those three teams were probably going to be around the same area in terms of points. I clearly did not have them even making the postseason, let alone winning the division, and now obviously uh, hosting the Stanley Cup final and being essentially or trying to be the favorite in the Stanley Cup final. So I was definitely wrong in where I projected them, but I mean, who was 99.9, yeah, exactly, people were wrong. So like I said, I'm happy that I'm wrong. It's such a phenomenal story. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, what's the vibe like around, you know, the building where you work is with this team? Because, I mean, like you said, it's it's a surprising story. I mean, you got to be in the halls looking at each other like, how about VGK? I mean, what's that vibe been like watching this team do what they've done? You know what? And it's not like they've been squeaking out wins. Yes, uh, Mark andre Fleury has four shutouts so far throughout the postseason, and uh, they have gotten – I would say, I kind of want to say, especially against San Jose, because uh, the sweep of the Kings was no joke. The Kings couldn't even put up any offense against them. Mm -hmm. uh, even, I think a lot of people were completely surprised in the fact that they, you know, took down Winnipeg in five. I know I was really surprised at the fact that they could beat them in five. But the San Jose series was the one to me in which they probably got away with getting a few wins that they didn't deserve. Um, and that series really could have gone either way if San Jose would have taken one of those two games in which they have played them. Um, but Marc-Andre Fleury, you know, stood on his head, and he's been really a huge part of their success story, but it's not the... Uh, I don't want to say the entire success story so far this postseason. Obviously, he's been a, a very big part um, of why they've been super successful. But, um, yeah, I just think it's the fact that the surprising part that we all keep saying is we just can't believe how well they've been able to execute versus, you know, and get other teams out of their game and out of their style. And to me, like I said, the most shocking was against the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, because you had a team who was, you know, just wildly successful offensively, um, especially someone like a Patrick Laine, who was completely, you know, quieted pretty much throughout the entire series. Um, and just, like I said, there was no secondary scoring whatsoever out of the Winnipeg Jets, in which that was such a huge part of their success uh, in the regular season. And, they were able to, you know, get timely goals and be successful against Connor Hallebach, whereas, you know, Mark andre Fleury really stymied uh, the Winnipeg Jets and their entire offense. And like I said, they were able to uh, use uh, their speed to their advantage and everything. So I think we're, we shouldn't be surprised anymore, but we continuously are surprised by this team, which I think even adds to the lore and the fun of watching Vegas and as successful as they've been. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you said, uh, Mark Andre out right now is the favorite in Vegas to win the Con Smythe, and with the absolutely, yeah, with the exception of probably, I would say, in my personal opinion, eight minutes of Game One, uh, mm -hmm. Vegas dominated uh, most of Winnipeg. What they threw at Winnipeg, or excuse me, what they threw at Vegas and Flurry. I mean, they were able to counterattack with the speed and uh, just being in the right yep. right place at the right time, which is kind of a motto of this season. But uh, let's. Let's look at, you talked about Flurry, and um, I don't want to discredit what Holpe's done over the last two and a half games against the Tampa Bay Lightning. I mean, when you come into this final matchup uh, here, uh, who, you know, who has the edge at this point? Because both goaltenders are playing, playing pretty well right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's even more interesting that those back-to-back -back shutouts in game six and seven were the first two of the entire season for Braden Holpe. Uh, yes, I know. Um, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so... I mean, he wasn't even able to put up, you know, uh, a donut in the regular season, which completely shocks me considering he was your 2016 Vesna winner, right? So mm -hmm. um, I think Mark Andre Fleury definitely has the edge. Even if, regardless of what's happened over the last few games, um, and even though Vegas is essentially going to be, you know, an entire week without playing a game, I still think he has an edge whatever happens in game one between these two teams. But, um, I mean, he's just been making the big saves whenever they, it, it counts. I don't find that he's really got a weakness. And when he does have a goal against, he bounce, bounces back really quickly. I don't know. It's just something about Marc-Andre Fleury that, you know, this run isn't, I kind of want to say it's it's not a fluke. And we saw what he was able to do with Pittsburgh last year, including shut out the Washington Capitals in Game 7. Mm -hmm. um, and then he had, unfortunately, one bad game against the Ottawa Senators, and that kind of ushered in Matt Murray. Well, the problem was Mike Sullivan back then didn't have a choice but to go to his number one guy, knowing that Marc-Andre Fleury wasn't going to be there this season. So I think that even adds to... I think the mental capacity of the flower, just because he knows that even if he does have a bad game, which he did um, against, I believe it was, yeah, Winnipeg, right? So I can't even remember, it was such a long time ago. He had one bad game, and Gerard Lam was like, don't really hope it's fine. Mm -hmm. But he knows he's the man. He knows he's got the confidence of his coaching staff, of his teammates behind him. He knows that he runs this ship in Vegas, and I think, I don't know, that gives him an even more edge regardless of how good his numbers have been and uh, the four shadows so far this postseason. Yeah, absolutely. And you talked about Gallant. He's just seemed to be able to push all the right buttons. And, uh, you know, yes. this is my first year um, being real in-depth as far as, uh, you know, with Flurry. I mean, I, I've been here on the West Coast, so, you know, obviously we know Mark andre but, you know, to know him up close and personal, he never really seems to get too high or too low. And that's what I think kind of keeps him level-headed, whereas I, I can see Holtby is a lot more streaky, a, a la like a Pecorine or something. He, he seems to make the, the routine saves look a little tougher than they should be. That's where I get out of Holtby. So the shutout streak that he's had lately uh, has been remarkable. But, yeah, you're right. I think I think Flurry has the edge in this one as well. Taking out Flurry and obviously, uh, you know, the great eight, the keys to the matchup are going to be the scoring lines, uh, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, you look at the two lines who – play for Vegas and you know they're essentially number two lines on most teams uh Carlson Marshall so Smith Neil Holla and Tuck and then you've got the line that you know in DC Ovi Backstrom Wilson you know you got TJ Oshie uh Kuznetsov and uh Verana I mean where do you see the advantage in there because both teams with their first and second lines are, are playing you know off the charts right now to be honest I actually when I look at the scoring in the postseason especially um, I don't know, I just feel like it's more of a top line versus everybody else because that's really how they've been kind of coming out and dominating. So, you know, we've seen, especially in the Winnipeg series, uh, that top line, Marcia so had two hell of a ho you know, hockey games uh, in which, you know, he scored a pair in both, uh, driving up in that Lamborghini, you know, with the Vegas decal. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he shows up game one doing the exact same thing because I, I believe now uh, the Golden Knights are 3-0 and when Marcia so drives the Lamborghini to Timo Ballerina. So I'm pretty sure they're going to try to keep that up for games one and two. Regardless, um, I honestly think that it's, 
just about the top lines and then everybody else. Fair enough. Um, so Vegas' top line honestly hasn't disappointed. I think um, Riley Smith, people would want to see him score a little bit more as well, but he's up there in terms of the assist leaders in the postseason too. So, I mean, he's still getting on the score sheet regardless of the fact that he only has two of the league goals this postseason. Where the other side of the coin, like think about it, you know, Ovi's had one of the best postseasons he's ever had uh, and in franchise history. He's got 12 goals already. Kuznetsov, uh, he's pretty much put up more points than any other Capitals player throughout a postseason run. I think he's got like 22. Um so that top line has been doing what they've been able to do. And then, it's like I said, it's pretty much just everybody else. So when you get Oshi chiming in, when you get, uh, you have Devontae smith probably score the game winner in uh, game six, mm-hmm. you know, you have uh, Jacob Zrana chipping in here and there. And then, of course, to me, the catalyst for a lot of it is John Carlson uh, for the Capitals. And he makes a lot of things happen, whether it's, his breakouts or his lead passes or just being the quarterback on the power play, he makes a lot happen. So it's the top line versus everybody and uh, getting uh, contributions from everybody else. And then with Vegas, they've been able to do so. And that second line was actually really quiet um, in especially the San Jose series. And you wanted to see more from guys like Neil. And, of course, Perron was in and out of the lineup for a bit as well, too. So it was Alex Tuck moving up. But... Um, yeah, they just, and think about it, the game-winning goal in Game 5 came from Ryan Reeves. You know, like, right. you're doing something right when your fourth line is contributing as well. So, I mean, if if the top lines are playing to their ability still, it's all about the secondary scoring, and that's how you get success either way. And um, I've used the example a few times now. Over the last two seasons in which Pittsburgh's been successful, to me, it's been their secondary scoring that were instrumental in their cup wins. You had Jake Gensel have the postseason he had last year, which nobody knew who the heck this guy was until he came out of the gates, you know, roaring last postseason. And the postseason before that, you had Brian Rust scoring every important goal in in an elimination game there was. So you have these guys kind of come up and score these massive goals for a team and that was really what put them over the edge in terms of winning back-to-back Stanley Cups, and I truly believe it's going to be the exact same thing for either one of these teams. Ovi and Marcia So and company, they will still put up their numbers, but it's going to be the secondary scoring overall, whether it's coming from defense or it's coming from your second, third, or fourth. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. It's just the secondary scoring has to chime in in those key opportune times. Yeah, absolutely, no doubt. Your role players, I guess you would say, you're, you're, you know, that fourth line with Belmare and Reeves, and you know, insert Carpenter, Carrier. It just seems to keep rolling. Nosek as well. I mean, Nosek, yeah. Nosek had a big, yeah. big goal in the Winnipeg series after taking a penalty and giving up. You're absolutely right. I mean, secondary scoring is going to be where the, uh, you know, the iceberg tips one way or the other in, f- in favor of Vegas or uh, or Washington. So, and really, I wouldn't be surprised, too, sorry, but like Nate Schmidt, right? Obviously playing against the team that discarded him. And I, I was a huge fan of Nate Schmidt, and I thought that was a, um, the smartest decision, uh, one of the smartest decisions George McPhee uh, made in terms of the expansion draft. Just I kind of felt like there were too many names over on the Washington side of things, and which is why in the postseason last year he had to take a seat. But, you know, getting a chance to see him in the Toronto series, like, I just felt like he was always, you know, he always had his feet moving, which clearly now you see it a lot more because the guy's playing 25 minutes a night, right? So I think, you know, someone like Nate Schmidt, he's going to want to be a game breaker even more so. And we've seen what he's been able to do as the postseason has progressed in terms of logging more minutes, in terms of uh, more end-to-end rushes. Um, and just starting the offense a lot more. And I think, obviously, against his former team, he's going to want to shine a lot more, and he is going to come out even more. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's been kind of the chip on the shoulder with with Vegas. You know, this year, you know, just watching the games myself, you you see the guy who is playing his team that, you know, let him go unprotected or traded him. You see that guy have that chip for that game. I mean, he's had it all year, but 
specifically that game, you see the, the intensity. This guy is going to get, you know, at least four, uh, you know, talking about Nate Schmidt against his former team. You mentioned uh, George McPhee and, 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 you know, kind of to get into his head, you know, almost like playing God here, two teams he constructed, uh, essentially. I mean, these are both, yep. you know, fingerprints all over his team. I mean, as he sits in the, in the, in the box here, I mean, what do, you, what do you think's going through his mind? It's unbelievable how things have played out for him. You know, I just, you can't help but feel happy because he was at, you know, the the face, essentially. The, him and Ovi were the faces of that franchise for how many years, you know, until uh, eventually his time was up in Washington. And it's like year after year after disappointment. And, you know, now he comes to Vegas, you know, projecting a six-year plan he gets it in year one, and then he's seeing on the other side of things that finally, you know, his the fruits of his labor are finally showing their true potential, and they're getting over that mental hump, and that's really what it was. It was the mental hump of, you know, the disappointment and the pressure and whatnot. Um, I mean, how could you not be happy? Like, I, I don't know. I think it's a really, really cool storyline, and, uh, you know, I think... To me, too, when I'm looking at other teams in the postseason and everything and, you know, uh, general managers that work hard and are with a certain team for a certain amount of time and they are doing the best in terms of building through the draft and developing players, you want to see it. You're hoping that the general managers are going to be there long enough for that potential to kind of reach its, you know, to finally fully bloom and come out. So that was another reason why that... I, I was kind of pulling for Winnipeg just because Kevin shoveled it off. He's had some brilliant drafts over the last five or six years. And, you know, finally he was starting to see the pieces come together after years of disappointment, right? So finally he gets this juggernaut of a team in which we're all thinking he was going to have. Uh, and then, you know, so it's just, it's very, very interesting to me to see that. But now George has it on two sides of the coin. So he's in a win-win situation, I think, either way. Well, the good thing for Shovel Day off is, uh, I, like you said, they, they're, they're set up into being a good position, uh, as well as Vegas. You know, that could become, you know, an interesting rivalry uh, going forward in the postseason. So, uh, you know, def- Absolutely. definitely nothing for Shovel Day off to be, you know, upset about. You know, he just ran into the, you know, the hot steamboat at that point. I think you play that series, yep. you know, you know, ten times in a row, you could have five series wins for both teams. So. I don't think uh, Winnipeg has anything to sulk about, uh, you know, going forward, uh, the future of that team. Um, you know, speaking of that, you know, I see on social media, you know, and I've, I've heard some of the radio stations and, and, and NHL Network, and it, some are saying that this could be bad for the NHL. Your thoughts? If Vegas wins the Cup, I guess I should preface that. So, listen, I guess what people are thinking, I mean, it, to me – Okay, the obvious things are if you win it all in season one, there's nowhere to go but down. That's right? fair. That's fair. So the, that, that, to me, is the only true fair assumption out of all of this in terms of why it could potentially be bad for the NHL. Because I don't really think they think it's going to be bad for the NHL. It's more so bad for the market, market of Las Vegas because how you are not going to truly test your fan base until, I don't know, maybe three, four years down the road, right? So you, I, to me, that would be the only alarming kind of thing um, in terms of why it would be bad for the NHL. And then a lot of people are thinking, well, in no other sport could you do this and, you know, comprise a team and then have them go to the Stanley Cup. Listen, so if this is how you're looking at it, first of all, you're seeing things glass half empty, and okay. the reason why I say that is in a lot of other professional sports, there aren't, there isn't a cap. It's a luxury tax, right? So players, you can sign players for oodles of millions of dollars, right? There's a cap for a reason, which is why uh, general managers had to make these tough decisions in the first place, right? Mm. So that's number one. You can't, you can't discredit the fact that the NHL is different compared to other major sports leagues and the fact that it has a hard cap. Um, so that's the first reason why this is even able to happen, right? right. Um, another thing is it's like you, you're trying to grow the game, obviously, and you want to do it as best as possible. And clearly, um, everybody in and around, you know, Vegas loves this team, and obviously it helps when you win. 
Uh, in terms of expansion and maybe, oh, well, good luck to Seattle. I think Seattle as well, there's roots in hockey already. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because you've got WHL teams that are already out there. You know, you also do have the proximity of, you know, Canada and Vancouver giving them a little bit more of a fan base as well. You know, so even though I, and creating that rivalry already. So, I mean, it's going to suck for Seattle because I'm pretty sure this isn't going to happen ever again. Um, so that could be another reason why people are maybe taking this a little bit more on the negative side of things. Um, but honestly, I mean, in the grand scheme, it's still having to put out on the ice, you know, you're still having, you know, 23, 24, whatever, 25 guys all out there um, and coaching and everything having to come together perfectly for a team to win a Stanley Cup. End of story. Like, you know what I mean? I just, to me, to kind of rain on that parade is just silly. Like, why can't we look at this for all the positives uh, that it gives us? The fact that, you know, when you uh, teamwork, teamwork is always going to trump anything or anyone who decides to be an individual. Why don't you look at the fact that, you know, if you work hard and you never give up, you are going to be successful. And a lot of these guys probably thought to themselves, oh, well, I don't know, it's, you know, either the twilight of my career, I'm not really going to, you know, they were given a second chance opportunity, right? So to me, I like to see all the positive things that come out of uh, this Vegas storyline, not all the potential negatives. And like I said, to me, the only worrisome part would be testing a fan base that's brand new to a sport. That's it. Because once you've hit that pinnacle, of reaching the Stanley Cup final and potentially winning the Stanley Cup, where do you have to go from there? It's very hard to maintain that status quo, right? If you won it all already, how do you maintain that status quo? It's pretty impossible. So that would be the only thing. And to be honest, I think, you know, Vegas fans are up for the challenge, but they have to understand that it is going to be a challenge for, you know, years on out, right? Um, But anything else to me is positive about this story. Absolutely, no doubt. And I agree with you 100%. You know, when, you know, the inevitable, you know, you know this team is going to have some hard times, uh, you know, how is the fan base going to react to that? Uh, it's absolutely 100% correct. You know, I look at a fan base that, you know, Vegas has been a city for, you know, over 100 years now. And for 99 plus of those, there's been no professional sports. So my hope is that because they don't want to see this team, God forbid, you know, use the R word, you know, relocation or anything, but um, you don't want to see this team leave when you just got them. I, I, I'm hoping that my, you know, this fan base here in Vegas can band together through thick and thin, and um, hopefully it, it attracts the casual fan as well who's looking for, you know, a free agent fan who's looking for teams. You know, I see a lot on Twitter people in all parts of this country and, and even around the world who have adopted this team, so hopefully that will continue, you know, through the hard times that, you know, hopefully – will never come, but inevitably more than likely will come as well. So Right. Well, and the thing is, too, that I you know, really like about this entire situation is, as you just mentioned, it's the first professional sports team to be in Las Vegas, and it's theirs. It's not being the, LA, the Raiders that are going to be relocated. Right. You know? So, and and that's, that's the thing that, to me, I think sticks out more, is that this team is and belongs to the city of Vegas. And that's why people have rallied around them so much. And that's why they're such an integral part of the community and why everything has gone well, because they've wanted something like this for such a long time. And now they have it. So you're right. Do they want that to go away? Because it's actually theirs. It's not a relocated team that's just being put there and whatever. Right. And not to mention too, the team has taken on the, lifestyle, the attitude, the Vegas you know, persona. Kind of. Yes, the persona of Vegas, where, um, you know, I think that goes a long way in what you just mentioned in terms of grabbing those casual fans. And you know what? If it's really hot out and you're visiting Vegas and you think to yourself, you know what? Let's just go check out a hockey game. That's still getting, you know, a couple people that may be brand new to the sport and get their butts in the seat. And then it's that experience that always grabbed you for hockey, hearing the skates, 
Um, and obviously in Vegas, they have the, the great opening uh, part of the show. You know, they have there's always a showmanship to it. To it, but mm-hmm. it's just the experience of being at a game, the electricity, like I said, the smell of the ice, the hearing the skates, the crisp passes from tape to tape. Um, just being there is really what gets people into it and seeing how fast this sport is um, in real life instead of on television. You know, I think that's really what gets people. So I think either way, you know, you, like I said, you have a team that is just personifying a city in itself, but it's also getting these new people that could be from all over the world, like you said, because people from all over the world visit the, the Vegas to come and experience the game of hockey. Absolutely. I mean, that's like you said, the casual fan, you know, getting a taste of live action hockey. I, I've always told people who, who aren't interested, you have to see it live, you know, at least once to, yeah. to make a definitive decision on what you feel, uh, how you feel about the sport of hockey. You, you know, it, it's that live sport, that live entertainment value uh, is second to none, in, in my personal opinion. And I'm sure you would probably agree with that as well. Um, uh, let's look at uh, oh, absolutely. Let's look at one final question, and uh, like we talked about it in the beginning, the sports books stand to take a huge hit, and uh, I want to know if Michelle is coming to Vegas to assist in, <laughs> in taking down the sports books. <laughs> um, unfortunately, not. I am not coming to Vegas to uh, take down the sports books, but I'm sure everybody is freaking out right now, um, considering what kind of underdogs they were uh, prior to this season, and now. Uh, what the reality is in terms of this team winning the Stanley Cup. Oh, my goodness. Um, unfortunately, no, I won't be there. But I'll be there in spirit because I'll be uh, watching every game and uh, and being in studio as well. Actually, we have a couple guys coming down uh, over for games one and two. So Nick Alberga, who is... Uh, my counterpart, he also hosts Ice Caps, so he'll be doing games one and two, and uh, I'll be hosting most likely games three and four from the studio uh, when the uh, series shifts to Washington. Right on. We definitely can't wait to hear that. Once again, we are chatting with Michelle Storino, host of Sirius XM's NHL Network Radio's Ice Cap. You can hear her definitely on Sirius XM Channel 91. Michelle, we uh, greatly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day, and especially given the pinnacle of what you cover right now, the Stanley Cup. I mean, this week's been crazy, uh, both in Vegas, both in D.C., and I'm sure back where you guys are. Uh, Once again, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your time, and uh, we appreciate you being aboard. Oh, my gosh, no problem. Anytime. I really, really appreciate it. If anyone wants to um, ever chat, I love uh, all of our fans and listeners of the station. Uh, You know, social media is a great thing because you get to reach out and just talk to um, everybody who's out there and who's either new or a massive fan of the game for many, many years. So if you ever want to reach out to me on social media, please do at Michelle Storino, Michelle with two L's, um, is how you do so on Twitter. And I love hearing from all our great fans and listeners and all your great listeners as well. Thank you so much. Right on, right on. We definitely appreciate that. Once again, you can catch Michelle Storino on Twitter, and you can catch her on Sirius XM's NHL Network Radio. Michelle, thank you very much again. No problem.